gosh. Hi, guys. <laughs> well, hey, welcome. Welcome to Red Rocks Young Adults. Welcome to Thursday nights. I am shocked that you guys have this much energy. I'm excited. <laughs> I love you too. I don't know who said that. Um, so hey, no, but for real, if you are here for the first time, I want to say welcome. Um, it's obviously a different night. So um, I don't think that you're here by accident. And then if you're one of the fabulous people that are joining us on Facebook or YouTube, um, we love you guys. And we want to pray with you, message us. If you want prayer, you are just as much a part of this congregation as the people in this room. And so it's an honor to get to know you guys. Sound good? Okay, so um, we were talking as an intern group, Ashlyn, Zach, and I, about what we wanted to talk about. And we thought it might be fun if we would take you guys way back to a high school class and speak to you guys from a Venn diagram. <laughs> kind of nerdy. <laughs> Um, but hey, so I'm going to speak to you about the first circle. Um, Zach and Ashlyn will come out and wrap us all up. Um, but tonight I'm speaking to you about your current situation. So your current reality, what makes up your day-to-day -day life. And so for me, there are two big things. Um, the first is that in 197 days, I get to marry my best friend. <laughs> oh. He is absolutely the best. Um, I love him so much, and we had a last-minute cancellation, so he's running graphics tonight because he loves us, and he loves the church, and he loves me. And so, um, Alex, if you wouldn't mind, would you please put up that group photo? Huh? <laughs> there we go. So this is the other part of my current situation, and that is 24 of the loudest, and I mean loudest, um, Jesus-loving, sleep-deprived, poor people that you will ever meet. <laughs> and that is the Red Rocks Church interns. Um, it's been an honor to serve alongside them. It is kind of mind-blowing at times that God would let me be a part of something that awesome. And so I was actually thinking the other day about how I ended up as an intern. And I remembered, um, I was sitting right back there. Hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was sitting right back there and Sean Johnson was on stage like right about here, which is crazy <laughs> that he was right here. Um, but he said something in passing. He said, if you move out of your comfort zone, that God will move with you. And so if you want God to move in your life, move out of your comfort zone. And it like hit me like a brick wall. I was like, okay, I needed to hear this. Don't panic, but do it quick or you'll be chicken. <laughs> so I like look around the auditorium and there's like not much to choose from in here. And I saw that camera. And so I was like, well, that's it. <laughs> that's about as far out of my comfort zone as I can get. And so I walked back there and I talked to Mark Ray, who's the tech director here at Lakewood. And I said, hey, so I don't know anything really at all about any of this, but he just said the thing with the comfort zone, and so I was wondering if you would, you know, like, need a volunteer. <laughs> and he said yes, and I bet he regretted that decision about 15 times in the next month, because I was blowing up his email, and for the next year and a half, I was the gnat in his ear. I would never, <laughs> I would never ever not show up. And so somebody would decline and I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> for real. And then like somebody would like get sick and I'm like, I'll stay for the six. I don't care. <laughs> and so I did for, for a year and a half, I was back there and I learned. And I started first on camera because that was like the thing that I saw. And then um, lyrics and graphics and, and lights and slow slowly but surely, little by little, and then all at once, I started to be in this role where I could just go wherever was needed. And so one Sunday I wasn't volunteering, which was incredibly rare, but I was running late, which unfortunately was like really common. Sorry, Alex. Um, <laughs> I was running late, and so I ended up at the Arvada campus, and once again, Sean was on stage, well, on screen, and he, he was preaching, and I can't tell you a word that he said. Not a single word, I have no idea. But what I do remember is that the whole earth fell silent for me. Everything felt muted, everything felt numb, except for one thing, and that was Arvada production, Arvada production. And so, once again, I was like, okay, you need to do this now or you'll chicken out. And so right after service, I walked back, and I talked to the tech director at the Arvada campus, and he said, hey, so I kind of learned some stuff, but I don't really know that much. Would you have me on your team? And he said, absolutely, I've been praying for um, more volunteers. And so um, fast forward two years, 
and I've been on the Arvada production team ever since, and I have sat under the leadership of John Clark. He is the tech director at Arvada, and he is one of the most incredible leaders that I know. He loves this church, he serves this church, and you would never know his name because his whole goal is to um, do production so well that you don't notice it. And so um, I've seen him lead people, I've seen him communicate well, um, and he has become one of my best friends, and he's modeled so much for me, whether that's um, marriage with his awesome wife, Katrina, um, but more than anything, it's been ministry. He does ministry well, and so as I watched him, I began to see that there might be a call on my life for ministry, and so I applied for the internship and ended up here, and so when I looked back on that, I just like look back to when I was sitting right over there, and I just say, wow, God, like you did all of this. Like I never, ever would have done any of this, but you did all of this. And so we see that all throughout the Bible. We see that, um, and, and basically any person you see in the Bible, you can read their story and then look back and say, wow, God, you did all of that. But tonight, we're gonna talk to you guys about Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and so if you're like old school and bring your Bible, you can turn there um, each each one of us are gonna speak from a different um, section, and I'm speaking from chapter one, verse 11, and it's honestly not even the full part of verse 11, um, but the last part, um, the first part's a prayer. But um, the, the verse I want to, to touch on is, um, it reads, now I was cupbearer to the king. Now, I was cupbearer to the king. And so to us, that doesn't seem like much, um, but I believe that to ne Nehemiah, it was a lot. It was probably um, a lot of his identity because he'd worked so long to get there. And so if you don't know what a cupbearer is, it's like a terrible job. And so his day-to-day -day would look like, okay, the king wants dinner, and he wants wine with his dinner. So I'm gonna take this wine, I'm gonna take a drink, and then wait see if I die, and then if I don't die, I give it to the king. And this was his life over and over again. Try the wine, wait, didn't die, serve it to the king. And so you can see that life and death is literally on the line. And so the king had to trust Nehemiah. He had to trust Nehemiah deeply in order for him to hold this position. And so we see throughout the rest of the book of Nehemiah, and Zach and Ashlyn will touch on that, that over and over and over again, Nehemiah will cry out to God and work what's in front of him. And so I began to imagine little spry, young, little Nehemiah as just a servant, as just a slave, no position of influence, basically a nobody. And I picture him like innocently talking to God and then working what's in front of him. Talking to God, talking about life, seeking him, and then working what's in front of him. And then the king saw that and maybe gave him some influence, maybe um, allowed him to lead a few people. And so Nehemiah was like, well, I'm gonna do what I've always done. I'm gonna cry out to God, and then I'm gonna work what's in front of me. And then the king saw that, and then gave him maybe a project. And so Nehemiah did what he always did. He dedicated it to God, he cried out to God, and then he worked what's in front of him. Cried out to God and worked what's in front of him. Cried out to God and then worked what's in front of him. All the way until the point where he had become the cupbearer all the point to where he had earned the king's trust. And so one day, Nehemiah was serving the king wine and, and the king noticed that Nehemiah is sad, that he's sad. And so he's like, are you sick? Like, what's wrong with you? And Nehemiah um, tells the king, the people, my homeland, Jerusalem, the city's broken, it's empty. And, and I, I'm gonna pray to God and I've prayed to God and I've been praying to God for months but I think I need to go work what's in front of me. I think I need to go and help these people. And so the king um, asks him a few questions and, and you can read about it in, in chapter one and two, um, but he asks him a few questions and then the king meets Nehemiah and says, it's okay. Not only um, are you allowed to go, but here's supplies. Here is um, letters to allow you to go through foreign territory. Like I trust you, go. And, and he would never have had that opportunity if it weren't for him serving the king that whole time. And so what would it have looked like with on his journey if Nehemiah was standing here and so focused on what he could become 
that he lost sight of what was in front of him, that he didn't steward well what was in front of him? What would it look like if he was at this point in life and he was so caught up with the person who's taking, that, who took his previous position, like messing it up, that he didn't work what's in front of him? But the truth is that Nehemiah did what he always does. He cried out to God and then he worked what's in front of him. And so what I want to ask you tonight, young adult, is what it's in, what's in front of you? What's in front of you? You might not have any money at all because you're an intern or you're a college student, but are you crying out to God and then putting your money to work in front of you? Maybe you have no money, but you have time. Oh, I said that wrong. You guys follow. Um, so maybe, maybe you have no, no time at all. Are you working your money in front of you? Are you crying out to God and then putting your money to work? Maybe you have no time and you have no money because you work Monday through Friday, you show up early and you stay really late to get to Friday with like no paycheck and no recognition. Are you crying out to God and working what's in front of you? You have no time, you have no money, but do you have a coworker? What's in front of you, young adult? And so the truth is, is that the interns and I, we have a hard and fast end date. May 20th is the end of our current situation, our current reality. It's just the end. Yeah, and that's exciting. And we have no idea what's next. We have no idea. And that's terrifying and exciting all at the same time. But I'm like promising myself and now I'm promising all of you is that no matter what happens at the end of this, I'm going to cry out to God and I'm going to work what's in front of me. And I promise that a year from now, I'll be able to look back no matter what happens. And if I cry out to God and work what's in front of me, that I'll be able to say, wow, God, you did all of this. Like You did all of this. And so <clears throat> the worship team is going to sing another song, and it's going to look different than normal tonight. Um, you can stand up or you can sit down. Um, you can sing along with the words on the screen or you can s contemplate life, whatever you want to do. But this is the time. Right now, this is the time that we cry out to God. We cry out to God and we say, God, I need your favor. God, I need your direction. God, I need you to bring to mind people that you want me to meet. God, define who I am. Define what my current situation is. Right now, we cry out to God, and then when we leave these doors, we go work what's in front of us. It's that simple. We go reflect God to what's in front of us. Whether that's work or whether that's school, we cry out to God, and then we work what's in front of us. And so, if you'd like to, you may stand, and the worship team is going to sing another song.
Jeez, Jackie was right there. Some energy out here tonight. I love it. Guys, thanks for being here. It is such an exciting night, as you might have noticed. Um, we are super honored to get to be up here. Um, so yeah, I know we're kind of crunched for time. So really quickly, for these, those of you who do not know me, my name is Ashlyn, and we are going to do... Hi, guys. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but that was a dance move. We're going to do a rapid fire, five things about Ash, so we can get to know each other a little bit. One, I love people. I love talking. Two, I am addicted to coffee. It is what keeps me vertical. Three, amen. I love the 1960s. It is my favorite decade. Four, amen, right? I am a city girl through and through. Nature and I are not simpatico. That's where I lose some of you. I knew it. And finally, you guys, I do have mad rollerblading skills. 
Like, I'm the next Tony Hawk, if anyone knows who that is still. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So before we jump back into the word, I do want to say a couple thank yous. Um, I have the most amazing friends and family, and a couple of them are here tonight. My little sister and her new hubby are in the audience tonight. Love them. And their adorable little baby boy, Mr. Jonah James, is back in Kids Rock, where he will hopefully stay. He seemed pretty good when we dropped him off. But thankfully, our Kids Rock volunteers are amazing. Hashtag serving Kids Rock. Hashtag work what's in front of you, right? Shameless plug, guys. I had to do it. I had to. Okay, guys, let's jump back into the word. Does that sound good? Okay. Turn with me. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 3. Didn't Jackie do awesome? Let's give it up for Jackie one more time. She's amazing. If you do not know her, that is your loss. You should get to know her. She's awesome. Okay, so we are going to jump in in Nehemiah chapter 3. And so what's going on right now is Nehemiah has left to go rebuild the wall in Jerusalem and rebuild the city. And he's kind of inspected the damage, taken inventory of what needs to be done. He's gathered a team, and they're about to start construction. And that is where we're going to pick up. And now, of course, I picked the passage of Scripture with, like, a bajillion of the world's most difficult names. So bear with me because I'm probably going to abbreviate them and we're just going to make that work. So here we go. Chapter 3, verse 1. So then Eli, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. Next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, we're going to call him Zach, the son of Imri built. The sons of Na built the fish gate. They laid its beams, set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Mammoth, the son of Utah, the son of Hak, repaired. And next to them, Meshalem, the son that's going to be Barry, and the son of Michelle, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Banana, repaired. We're going to go with it. Thank you, thank you. I butchered all of those. So you're welcome. So guys, tonight Jackie talked all about our little Venn diagram. She touched on, is that going to pop up? There we go. Our current situation. She talked about honoring God with where you're at. Crying out to the Lord and working what's in front of you. Crying out to the Lord and working what's in front of you. And I want to continue that conversation and talk to you about the fact that you were not only created, but loved uniquely by God. And because of that, young adult, you have a specific role to play in his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I love you so much. Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this time that we get to gather as a group of young adults and just pursue you. Holy Spirit, we give this space to you. We ask that you would continue to move in this night. God, I step aside. I ask that only your words would be said. Jesus, do what only you can do. Speak to individual hearts tonight. Give each person exactly what they need. Jesus, we love you and we trust you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, how many of you have or have heard of the movie pass? Anybody? No one? Okay, there's, like, there's a couple. You guys, this is the best kept secret ever. I'm letting all of you in on this because it's amazing. It is $10 a month, and you can go to literally a different movie every day. Like, that's amazing. All of my friends have one. They're, like, obsessed with it. And the other night, I was sitting in my little 300-square-foot apartment, and I was like, almost going to cave. I had my laptop up, my credit card information ready, but as Jackie said, we're all broke. So I was like, maybe you shouldn't do this, but I was like, no, I should. And then something stopped me, something bigger than my lack of money. I realized that I'm not sure if that's the healthiest thing for me. See, I don't just like go to movies. I like go to movies. Does anybody else? Like, right? When I'm in a movie, if I like a character, I'll take on that role for like weeks to come. It's kind of bad. No joke. I remember when I first saw Soul Surfer. Anyone see that? Circa 2011. Come on. That was a great movie. I pretended to be Bethany Hamilton for a straight month. I was, I was convinced. I remember it was my freshman year at CU Boulder, and I was in the dead of winter, still rocking the Rip Curl t-shirts and flip-flops. I was like, yeah, I would try and get ready with one arm just to see if I could do it. I know, I know, it's not good. But props to her, it is hard. She makes it look so easy as she's like surfing. I'm like trying to curl my hair and I burn half my face. But she's a better woman than I'll ever be, so props to her. 
Guys, I fully YouTubed how to like duck dive. For those of you who don't know surfing vernacular, it's okay. A duck dive is when you like duck your board under the wave to dive under it. Yep, in the middle of my dorm room, I was practicing how to duck dive and YouTubing how to do that. I was convinced that I was a pro surfer. I was like, here we go, US Open, here I come. I'm really not sure if that's surfing or golf, but we'll go with it. It's fine, it's okay. <laughs> and so, there was only two small roadblocks on my way to becoming a professional surfer. One, the fact that I happen to live in Colorado, which happens to be a landlocked state. Geography, that one's not my fault. And two, I've never duck dove in my life. I, you put me in the middle of the ocean right now and ask me to duck dive, everyone's gonna be ducking because I'm going to be taken out. It's not gonna be good. But you guys, when I stop and think about it, how often in our day-to-day -day life do we get lost striving to fill roles that we were never meant to play? Right? Like, I was never meant to be a pro surfer. That's obvious. But you know what? I wouldn't be good at it. I wouldn't be effective there. And I love it because God created you in your unique way to reflect his love to the world in a way that only you can. I love this quote by Lisa Bevere. She says, I heard the Holy Spirit whisper, I do not love my children equally. Equal implies that my love can be measured, and I assure you, it cannot. Same would mean that my children are replaceable or interchangeable, and they are not. My heart is not divided into compartments. No one could take the place of or displace another in my heart. For you see, I do not love my children equally. I love them uniquely. Look at the story of Nehemiah. Yeah, we could clap for that. Love it. Look at the story of Nehemiah. Each person's role in building the wall was necessary and important, but they were all different. So you can't have a wall just made up of gates, nor can you have a wall just made up of stone. It wouldn't be complete, right? You have to have all the parts. They're all vital. Young adult, can I remind you that your role is necessary? Yeah. Your role is. So, in Romans 12, Paul talks about the various parts of the human body. And I love this because this is just another reminder that each part is so vital. It says, in this way, we are like the various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each one of us finds our meaning and function as a part of his body. But as a chopped off finger or a cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, now would we? So, since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we were made to be without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves to others, trying to be something that we're not. In the body of Christ, you have a specific and intentional role that the creator of the universe carefully and particularly carved out for you and your unique quirks and your personality and your giftings. You have a role to play. And I truly believe that in order to discover our role in this life, we have to get to know the author of life. Nehemiah was able to live in freedom as he walked in his calling because his life was fully surrendered to the will of God and he trusted him completely with who he was. It's like Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. We all know it. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. See, young adult, he promises us the path. He gives us the role. Our job is to trust him, right? As I was preparing for this, like, all week I, I was praying. I was like, okay, Lord, give me something. Like, what do I have to say? Give me a word. Give me something new. Give me something, like, mind-blowing so they think that I'm super spiritual and wicked smart. <laughs> a couple people got the reference. Love it. Um, but as I was praying, so I'd sit down and I'd be like, okay, Lord, I'm ready for it. Like, give it to me. And all that the Lord would ask me is he'd be like, who am I to you, Ash? And I'd sit there and I'd be like, my goodness. God, you are my good, my loving, my perfect heavenly father. You are the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You're the savior of the world. And yet you're my best friend. And then he'd say, Okay. So then who are you? And the only thing that would come into my mind in those moments was, God, I am who you say that I am. 
I am who you say that I am. Do you know what your God says about you, young adult? Do you? You are chosen. You are not forsaken. Young adult, you are loved. You are worthy. You are called. You are gifted. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are a saint. That's that's what your father calls you. And despite what you feel, the fact of the matter is, is that the truth of God's word trumps your feelings every time. Every time. So, Don't settle for a second-rate, copyright version of someone else's story when we serve the God of unique, handwritten manuscripts. Don't settle for a second-rate version of someone else's story when we serve the God of unique, handwritten manuscripts. But will you trust him? Will you trust him with your story? Will you trust that his plans for you are good? See, it's not your job to create it, to manipulate it, or write it. It's your job to discover it and receive it. If everyone could stand, the band's going to come out here, and they're going to play another song, and then Zach's going to bring it all home. And as we go into these last few moments, I want you to just take a minute, clear out all the voices, anything in your mind that's telling you that you're not enough, any voice of striving or comparison, any voice of doubt or insecurity, whatever it may be, just clear your mind. And I want you to listen to your Heavenly Father because I believe He wants to speak with you. Ask Him. Ask Him to speak with you. Ask Him to remind you who He is and therefore who you are. If you need help trusting Him with your story, invite Him into that process. Ask Him to start revealing to you specifics about your unique handwritten story. I don't know where this finds you. I don't know what you're going through. But I do believe that your Heavenly Father wants to meet with you tonight. So let's worship.
Amen, amen, amen. Let's keep that praise going. Let's keep it going. All right. All right, everybody. Y'all can take a seat. Y'all can take a seat. Hey, hey. So. <laughs> oh, this is fun. You guys do have a lot of energy. Um, and this is the third person, so thank you. Well, that's very nice. All right, so, um, hey everybody, my name is Zach Atwood, and I am the third and final intern for tonight's intern takeover. And so with that comes another round of hellos and another round of thank yous, and sorry, I'm not sorry, I got the mic, you gotta listen. All right, so first off, I wanna thank my friends for being here. I wanna thank, yeah, friends, yeah, friends. Um, <laughs> I wanna thank my life group for sharpening me and for sharpening my beliefs. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank my family for supporting me during this season of life. I want to thank my parents for allowing their large 25-year-old adult son to move back into their house so he could pursue this crazy dream of ministry. And, and on that note, on that note, I got to give a special shout out to my mom because Karen Atwood, Karen, you know, you know she loves me because the lady gave up her ticket to Hamilton to be here tonight. Yeah. Yeah, we can give Karen a round of applause for that. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> All right, and my, my final thank you tonight is to the women who went before me on stage, to, to Jackie and Ashlyn. They, they slayed it on the stage, and they brought us a good word. Amen? And I, I'm just so humbled and so honored to work with these women in ministry, and not only them, but there are so many powerful women in this church. And so I just want to kind of say on a side note that if you are a woman and you are interested in ministry or you are working in ministry right now, or heck, you're just living in 2018, I want you to know that, that this church, that we are behind you, that we pray for you, that we care for you, that we love you, and that we will fight with you wherever you go and lead with you wherever you go. All right. Um, awkward transition. Um, we're going to jump back into the Venn diagram. Amen. All right, so we've got these three circles that we've been talking on tonight. The first circle, Jackie was talking about our current situation and how Nehemiah, what he would do is he would cry out to God and then he would work what's in front of him and he would cry out to God and work what's in front of him. And for us as young adults, we have the opportunity because we have our time, our talents, and our treasures. And we get to take ownership of those and we get to go cry out to God and work what's in front of us. The second circle that we talked about, we talked about uniqueness. And Ashton was talking about how Nehemiah and all his bros head up to Jerusalem, and they're going to go rebuild the city. And while they're rebuilding, none of them are looking to their left. None of them are looking to their right. They're not comparing one another. They're owning their skill set, and they're rebuilding the city. And how for us, as young adults, we have the opportunity to either live out somebody's second-rate copy of our lives, or we can step into the story that God has uniquely written for us. And this third circle that we're going to be talking about is the call. Now, the call that was on Nehemiah's heart and the call that's on every single one of our own individual hearts. When these three circles, when they line up, this is where God wants us. This is where we are most effective for the kingdom. This is where we begin to know God and to make him known. So... I'll be talking about the call. And what, what, what was Nehemiah's call, first and foremost? So we first meet Nehemiah. He goes up to his bro and he asks, hey, how's Jerusalem? And he responds and says, Jerusalem's not good. They're in shambles. They've been attacked time and time and time again. The gates are broken. The wall is damaged. And so we're, we're, needed, we're needed there. The people are missing and they're being attacked. And so Nehemiah is just so heartbroken by this. He's heartbroken that his hometown has been destroyed and that his people are, are leaving or they're, or they're dead. And so Nehemiah is, is so burdened by this that it's wearing on his face. And so he goes and he's going to work his current situation. He's going to his job and the king notices. And he says, well, hey, what's going on? Why are you sad? And Nehemiah responds and he cries out to God and work what's in, works what's in front of him. And the king responds and says, hey, I'll let you go. And I believe the reason why the king allowed Nehemiah to go was because Nehemiah was under God's will. He was pursuing the call. And so God opened the door for him to continue to pursue the call in his life. And so Nehemiah and his friends, they head out. They go and they start building up the city. And they're doing a fantastic job. And so they get to the point where they, they build up the gates and they build up the walls. And Nehemiah looks around. And he kind of notices something. So we head to Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 4. Now the city was large and spacious, 
but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it on my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. This was Nehemiah's call. Nehemiah's call was to build and to grow the city. Nehemiah's call was to build and to grow the city. And so you're probably sitting there and you're thinking to yourself like, cool, Zach, like, oh, he's a carpenter and construction worker. So like, is all of our calls now to like go forth and work in the construction industry? Like, I know Denver's booming and the rent's really high, but there's a lot of opportunity for these jobs. But like, I'm a biologist or I'm studying engineering. So what do you want? That's not what we're talking about. The beautiful thing about Nehemiah's story is that Nehemiah's story is a giant analogy for what our call is now, what our call is in our own individual lives. So while Nehemiah was physically building up a city, while he was physically building up Jerusalem and bringing people in, this was under the Old Testament times, under the Old Covenant, under Mosaic Law, and this is what was supposed to happen to bring the people back to the Promised Land. Now for us, we're sitting in the New Testament times, under the New Covenant, under the Law of Jesus Christ, And so our call, it's the same. It's to build and to grow, but this time there isn't a city. Our call is to build and grow the kingdom. Our call is to build and grow the kingdom. This is the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, 19, this is is what we're meant to do. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's our call, young adults. But I think I, I want to talk to something, and I pray that this sets some of us free tonight. I feel like for a lot of us, we get the call confused. We get the call confused in our hearts. What we end up doing is we end up confusing our career with our call. We get our career and our call confused so easily. Now, Nehemiah and his, and his friends, while they're in the rebuilding process, they encounter this situation. While back in the day, if you, if you came in and you were starting to help out and grow a city, you were given a lot of opportunity. You were given a lot of things. You were treated like city council, essentially. So as a governor or a mayor, you were entitled to a lot. So you were entitled to, to land, to servants, to a salary, and you got kind of everything paid for. Like every meal was legit cooked for you. Shout out to my mom again. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> So these guys are getting a lot of opportunities. They're getting a lot of offers. But Nehemiah, what he does is, this is what he responds with. Nehemiah 5.16. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for work. We did not acquire any land. Now the reason why Nehemiah and his guys, why they didn't accept those things, is because they had an understanding on their hearts. They knew that the project was bigger than the position. They knew that their career was not as important as their call and that their call trumped everything and that their career would not be able to. Their career would not, would not allow them to experience joy. And I think young adults, sometimes when we begin to confuse our career with our call, we begin confusing other parts of our life. We begin confusing our self-worth with our salary or our self-worth with our grades. And when we begin confusing those things, we become hurt because all of a sudden you don't get that bonus that you had expected. All of a sudden you don't get the grade that you had expected. And so now you're starting to question your calling. You're starting to question your relationship with Christ. You're starting to feel jaded by Jesus ultimately. But young adults, I want to set us free. I want us to know that your career or your college, it's not your call. Your call is to go and make disciples of the nations. Your call is to take the uniqueness that God has for you, the story that he's handwritten for you, and bring it to your situation wherever you find yourself. So you can stand. You can stand here as a, as a part-time coach, and you can say, I know who I am. I know who I'm loved by, and I can share the gospel with my players. I can share the gospel with the coaches that I work with, and I can share the gospel with anyone that'll listen around me. You can stand here as a doctor, And what you can do is you can say, I know who I'm loved by and I know who I get to love on. You get to physically heal patients, but also on the same note, you get to tell them about the restorative love that Jesus Christ has for their souls. You get to stand here as a a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, and you get to acknowledge that 
God loves you so much, so much so that you go out and you pour out to your children. So they go and they baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is our call, young adults. It's nothing crazy. It's nothing wild. But what God wants for us is he wants us to own the call that's on our lives, to take our unique handwritten story and to step into whatever situation we find ourselves in. And that's that's where God wants us. That's where the fruit is had. That's where the harvest is had. That's where the unexplainable joy is had and the peace, the unsettling peace. So young adults, could, could everyone stand up with me? Can we get real for a minute? Let's get real. Let's get real. All right, so I want to ask a couple of questions. And if you want to respond to these questions, I'd ask that you just raise up your hand and keep them up. My first question is this, is that you have a relationship with Christ, but you're finding yourself in a situation that you didn't, you didn't plan out. You didn't know that you would be stuck in this situation and you're hurting. You're hurting in your situation, but you need strength and courage to cry out to God and to work what's in front of you. If you need that strength and courage, can you just lift up your hand? Amen. Keep them up. Keep them up. My next question is this, is that you're here tonight and you've been looking to your left, you've been looking to your right, and you're looking at other, other people's stories and you're trying to take on those stories, but God is calling you to just surrender to the story that he has for you. If that's you, if you need to surrender to your story, raise up your hand, keep them up, keep them up the whole time. My next question is this, is that you have pursued so many calls in your life or what you thought were calls. You've pursued careers. You've pursued college. You've pursued relationships that you thought were calls. But tonight is the night that you need God to realign what that call is. If you need to realign your heart to what the call is, can you just raise up your hand? Young adults, look around. Look around. You're not alone in this. But God wants this so much for us. He wants us to take these situations and he wants us to surrender these to him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for what you've done tonight. I thank you for the conviction that you've brought in our hearts, Lord. I thank you for the revelation that you've instilled for us, Lord. I want to ask one more question tonight with every head bow and every eye closed. You came in here tonight, whether you were invited or you came in here by accident, but God He's calling you into a relationship with him. He's asking you to invite him into your situation. He's saying, invite me into your story. Invite me and I'll give you a call. I'm going to count to three and I I want you to raise your hand if that's you tonight. If you want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ for the first time. One, the God who created the highest of mountains and the deepest of oceans so desperately wants a relationship with you. Two, this God sent his one and only son to go up on a cross to bear our sin, to bear our shame, to bear whatever we're in bondage to right now. And he he eradicated that just for you so he could have a relationship with you. Three, if that's you, can you raise your hand if you want to have a relationship with Christ tonight for the first time? Amen. Amen. Keep him up. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, I, I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing tonight, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you brought people from death to life. God, it is, it's a miracle. You are, God, you are so good, God. Lord, I, I pray that what we, what we learned tonight, what you instilled on our hearts tonight, that it doesn't end here, but that, Lord, we go out, out of these four walls and that we bring this message to everyone around us, no matter the situation we're in, and we take our story with us and we share the love of Christ with everyone around us. God, we love you so much. It's in your powerful, precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Young adults, let's worship.